Good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, some practical things you might want to keep in mind when designing neural network architectures, in particular the kind of memory requirements of these um, architectures and the kind of computational uh, considerations you might need to keep in mind. Um, so it's useful when you're designing uh, deep neural network architectures to be able to do a quick calculation on the back of an envelope and kind of figure out how much, how long is it going to take to actually process my data with this, and, and how much memory is it going to take up. Um, and this lecture is going to cover estimating um, the the memory consumption of a neural network um, when you're both when you're training it and when you're uh, testing it. Um, mini batch sizes and, and a, a particular trick for dealing with if you've got kind of a small amount of memory but you want to increase your your mini batch size. Um, we're also going to look at estimating um, neural network computation. So this is the number of floating point operations per second, or flops. Um, and uh, if I have time at the end, I'm going to give a little note on um, estimating aperture sizes. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what that is later on. Um, okay, so I think yesterday there was a question and someone was asking, like, how, how many layers should we put in these networks? How big should we, we make them? And if you have got enough data, the answer is usually bigger is better, right? So if you can, you add more layers or increase the width of the layers, um, you often get a, a performance boost, provided you've got sufficient regularization. And this can be seen here on, on the right. So these are the figures for the ImageNet uh, challenge. Shabby's going to talk about the ImageNet challenge later on. Um, but essentially, it's a classification task. You've got about a million, million examples. You've got to predict a thousand classes. And um, since 2012, you can see that the number of layers that the networks have been using um, has increased a lot. So we started off with something like seven layers, and then there was 19 and 22 in Google's one. And now with these residual networks that we have, we, these, these things have hundreds of layers. And the accuracy and top five accuracy has been, or top five error rate has been going down. So um, more layers people are getting better performance. Um, so when you're building these massive networks like this, it just indiscriminately making things larger um, is usually a bad idea because you'll find pretty quickly that you'll run out of memory. So this is a kind of a way to, to estimate the, the memory requirements. Um, so now obviously increasing the network size means using more memory. Um, in particular, at training time, you need memory to store the outputs of the intermediate layers. So uh, you have a convolutional layer, all the filters that that produces, they need to be stored. And um, you need memory to store the parameters of the network, so these are the, the things you're trying to optimize. You need to memory to store the error signal, so when you're doing back propagation, as we've seen yesterday, there's this error that propagates back through it, so you need to have somewhere to store this. Um, you need somewhere to store the gradient of the parameters, so um, for each parameter, there's a gradient associated with it, you need to compute that and then update your parameters, that, that will need memory. And also, you need any extra memory that will be needed by the optimizer. So various different optimizers and neural net frameworks use memory in different ways, depending on to, to so sometimes the optimizer might use momentum. I think momentum was mentioned yesterday. You need extra memory to store the momentum parameters. Um, at test time, you usually need a lot less. So you'll need memory to store the intermediate outputs of the layers going forward and the parameters, but you don't need to store any of the gradients or anything like that because you're not going to go backwards and update them. You just need to go forward. So even if you're you're, you need a big GPU to train your model, you might be able to actually use a smaller GPU to actually uh, use it for prediction. Um, and modern GPUs um, are still relatively memory constrained in comparison to the amount of memory that you might have on a, on a CPU-based machine. So the kind of one that's used quite a lot in deep learning at the moment is the GTX Titan X. It's reasonably inexpensive as far as it goes, as 12 gigs of, of RAM on it, and that's considered big, right? And all the other ones, so the GTX 980 is the kind of gamer, high-end gamer one that has only four gigs of, of RAM. Um, the Teslas, which are really kind of expensive cards that are, um, have a bit more, a uh, bit wider um, floating points and things like that, and they have um, 12 and five, so this is kind of the limits of where we are with the kind of desktop size GPUs at the moment. So. If you're training a big model, you really do have to keep an eye on, on how much memory um, you have available. <coughs> so calculating memory requirements. Um, so the network will be practically bound by the amount of, of memory that you have. Um, and it's useful to be able to estimate the, these requirements. So the true memory usage, though, does depend on the implementation. It does depend on the framework that you're, you're using and whether you're using, say, CUDNN, the uh, fast CUDA library, or, or, or not. So uh, keep that in mind. So these are just kind of estimates that you can make. Um, you'll notice if you're doing things, so you guys might be using CPU to train networks, you'll notice that convolutions, for example, might take up a lot more memory on, on this, on this uh, CPU, and I'll say why that is, but um, it's basically an implementation detail. 
Um, so okay, we'll start off with how you calculate the model size. And by model size, I mean how, how, how much memory does the parameters take, so the weights and the biases in your model. Um, so for convolution layers, uh, the number of weights in the convolution layer doesn't depend on the input size. So convolution applies the same operation, multiple locations in the image, right? And it uses the same parameters with weight sharing. So it doesn't matter how big the, the, the image is, the, the number of weights is the same. So it doesn't depend on that. It depends only on the depth, so that's the number of filters that you have, uh, the kernel size, so that's the width and height of the convolution, and the depth of the layer below, how much you're going to look at, how, how, how many filters were output on the previous layer. And if it's the, the input layer and that's an image, then that's like three, for example, you got or G and B. Um, so the number of parameters here then is the depth of this layer times the kernel width, kernel height times the depth of the layer below it, right? And the number of biases is just the depth of this. So you got one bias for each, each, uh, each layer here, or not each layer, each filter. Um, so in this case, we've got this network. I don't know, yeah, you can kind of read that, I guess. Um, so this has got 32 deep here. Uh, we're using 3x3 three three filters, so this is 3x3 three three convolutions, and this is a, just a grayscale image here, so it's just by one. So this, this, this layer here has 288 parameters and 32 biases. And you can do the same as you go up here. So this one has got 32 here, uh, th looking at 32 on, on the layer below, and 3x3 three three filters, so this is 9,000 and only 32 biases. Um, pooling layers, uh, well, you're just pooling, you're just taking a max over a region, right? So you, there's no parameters there, parameters there at all. So they're parameter free. Fully connected layers, quite simple. The number of weights in these layers is just the number of outputs times the number of inputs. So each input is connected to an output. So that's just simple. And, and the biases is the number of outputs. Um, if the previous layer was a convolution layer or something like that, then and it has spatial extent, so like it's pooling or convolution, if it's got some width and height, then the number of inputs is just the size of the flattened layer. So you basically flatten out all your dimensions. So it's just one big long vector, and that's, that's the number of inputs. So in this case, uh, we have 128 um, units here. And uh, this pooling layer was 14 by 14 and had 32 filters. So that's the number of outputs is 14 by 14 by 32. So you've got about 802,000 parameters here. Um, so yeah, you can see where the bulk of the parameters is in this network right away, right? I mean, if you look at the previous ones, there's like 9,288. Here's where most of your parameters are. Um, and then this final. Uh, output layer, which is a fully connected layer followed by softmax, same thing. So your total, just add them all up, right? And then if you're using 32-bit floats, which nearly everybody will use, because that's what you, kind of precision you need for these things, that's about this, this whole model here, which actually works pretty well on, on MNIST, um, is about 3.1 megabytes in size, right? So, um, so, okay, that's just a model. That's one of the things you've got to consider when, when you're doing this, and that'll be the size of the thing that you would distribute if you wanted to you know, share this model on the internet. But um, when you're actually doing the computations, you need to uh, store intermediates as, as you're going up. Um, so um, these are called blobs in, in CAFE and, and a few other things. Um, so the, for convolution layers, it's pretty easy. It's just the width times the height times the depth. So with the parameters, we didn't need any, we didn't need to take, worry about the width or the height, but when you're actually uh, performing this on an image, you need to store that many outputs as width and height. So, you know, for these two layers, it's the same. It's just the, the 32 filters times width and the height, it's about 25,000. And uh, this one here is the same. With pooling and cons, the same thing. Um, so fully, and the fully connected layers, just the number of outputs, right? So that, that's pretty simple. Um, so when you're actually um, training, um, you need sort of memory for various different parts. So uh, the memory for the parameters, but we always really seen how to calculate that. You actually need that times three usually if you're using momentum. So you need it for the parameters. You need the same amount for the for the parameter gradients, and you need it for the momentum parameter if you've got momentum. So um, I guess you'll see a bit more about this during optimization where that memory is used. Um, and then you need memory for the layer outputs and for the error. And these are both the same size as well. That's why I have them both in blue. And whatever overhead for your library. So memory for convolutions. Um, when you're going forward, you just want to do prediction. You don't want to do training. These grayed out boxes go away. You don't need them anymore. So, uh, so between this figure and the things before, you should be able to quickly calculate how much memory your network is going to use. So, okay, so convolutions are kind of worth mentioning because uh, particularly if you're doing them on the CPU, they tend to be implemented as matrix multiplications. 
uh, and that can have kind of implications for how much memory you're going to use. So if, if they're done as matrix multiplications, it's called convolution lowering. And basically the idea is, if, if you have this, um, this is your image here, and your convolution is obviously sliding this window along it. If you're sliding a five by five window along this, uh, to do this by convolution lowering, what you essentially do is you take each one of these boxes here, so there's 25 pixels in that, and you flatten it out, and then you take move it to the one pixel to the right, you flatten that out, and you have 25 pixels here, and you keep doing that so you have whatever the number of pixels is in the input image, so 224 by 224, which is 50,000, um, times 25, right? So you've, you've increased the amount of memory you need to store this because you've sort of duplicating things. But by doing this, you can do it as a matrix multiplication, right? So then your kernel is just a 25 by one. So five by five, just flatten it to 25 by one kernel. Multiply this by this, and you get the outputs of your convolutions. And the reason that we do this instead of having a big nested loop with like something like eight depth nesting is because um, BLAS, which is one of the libraries that is, does all of these um, kind of matrix vector multiplications, is really highly optimized, and it's got implementations on GPUs and CPUs and all these things. So by doing it this way, you're really taking it uh, advantage of all the hard work that people have done in the past making matrix multiplications fast and doing it this way it tends to be a lot faster than trying to hand code some loop to do it um, it's worth mentioning though that if you're using CUDNN uh, it doesn't do it this way it does something like this but it's a lot more memory efficient and there's a paper there you can look up if you're interested in the details um, so okay many batch sizes so the total size as I was saying in, in the previous slides is only for one single example right and usually you don't want to compute your gradients with respect to just one example because that's pure stochastic gradient descent. So you have this, you're trying to find, okay, how should I improve the loss based on this one example? How should I get better at this one example? But that doesn't really tell you how well, you, how good you can improve the loss based on your whole data set, which is what you want to do. Um, so, but to try and do it with the whole data set, that's full gradient descent, that's going to be very expensive because taking one step, you've got to process all your examples. So what people do is something in the middle and it's mini batch. Uh, stochastic gradient descent. So you take a subset of your examples, just randomly sample, say, 20 examples, and you compute the gradient with respect to that. So it's the average gradient over all 20 examples. That's a bit more robust than one single one, so it's a bit smoother. Um, and it also takes advantage of GPU hardware um, because, you know, with a GPU you can do loads of things in parallel, so if you do a whole batch at the same time, that's going to be faster than shipping one example to the GPU, computing gradients with update. You ship you know, 20 examples and fill up your GPU memory, use all its computation, compute the gradient and come back, that's going to be much faster. But of course, if you've got a really big model and a smallish GPU, um, the size of your batch is going to be limited by the, the, the architecture and, and the model size and the hardware memory. Um, so you may need to reduce the batch size with this. Um, but if you reduce the batch size too much, then it may take a long time to converge because your gradients are very noisy. So, so what do you do about this? So one of the things people tend to do um, is what's called gradient splitting trick, or maybe it's called something else. This is what I, I know it as anyway. Um, so you, you make smaller mini batches, first of all. Um, so maybe you can fit, maybe instead of 20 images through it, you can only fit like five, right? And uh, you, you'd really like to use a mini batch size of say 15, but you can't because they won't, they won't all fit through. So you, you use five and you, you pass this through your network, you compute your loss. You back propagate your gradients and you get your um, gradient of the loss with respect to the first mini batch, right? And then instead of updating the gradients right there and then, you just store that somewhere in CPU memory, right? And keep it there. And then take your second mini batch, do the same thing, go through, compute the loss, back propagate, get the gradient with respect to the second batch, store that somewhere on the CPU memory, let RAM or on the, on the disk, do the same with the third. And then when you've got all these three done together, or you can do it up to n times. You just average the gradients from all of them. So now you've got the whole batch together. That's the same as doing the whole big batch at once. So, okay, it's three times slower. So you've, you've traded off a little bit of speed, but you've got much more stable gradient updates. So uh, it's just a practical thing you can do when you're trying to train big models and small GPUs. Um, yeah, so this is loss on batch end, just notation there. Um, yeah, so, okay, so that's the kind of met back of the envelope memory calculations. Um, the other thing you might want to be concerned about is computational complexity. So how, how long does it take to go do a forward pass is usually what people are concerned about. You can just multiply that by two if you want to know how long it takes you to do a backward pass and a forward pass. Um, so it's usually estimated by the number of multiply adds in the fully connected and, and conv layers. The other layers don't really 
cost that much in comparison to them, the bulk of the computations in the fully connected and conv layers. And typically we estimate number of floating points operations, which is just a, a multiply add, so a combination of multiplying and add. Um, we're always doing in our products, so these are co common uh, operation. And uh, we tend to ignore any nonlinearities, drop out and things like that when we're, when we're actually computing this. So uh, it's pretty easy to do. So for fully con uh, connected layers, um, number of operations is just number of inputs times number of outputs. Um, so it's equal to the number of weights, basically. Each weight needs to be multiplied by something and added to the next one. So you know, intuitively, that's exactly what it is. For convolutional layers, uh, it's a product of the spatial width of the map, so the width of the thing coming in from below, the height of the thing coming in from below, the, the depth of the thing coming in from below, the current layer depth, uh, the kernel width, and the kernel height. So it's a product of all of these things together. So uh, this table here just shows what the what the um, the computations flops are for something like VGG16. So um, input obviously doesn't require any, uh, but if you if you multiply and add up these numbers in the right way, basically you get these numbers here. And if you can see, all of these ones here are uh, to the exp exponential to the nine, and these ones are lower. So it's quite clear already here that convolution is where most of your work is going to be done in a convolutional network. These fully connected layers tend to be a bit cheaper. The, the convolution layers is, is where the bulk of the computation is done. Okay. Um, yeah. So the last thing I'm going to mention is how to compute the effective aperture size, as it's called. So when you're designing these networks as well, you, you often want to how big should I make my convolution layers and how much pooling should I put in? And it, it really depends on how much you want any particular um, neuron in your network to see in the image. How much of it do you want to take? How much, what is it, how big of the image, patch of the image is it a function of, right? So um, to do, that's called the aperture size or the, uh, the coverage sometimes or sometimes the receptive field size. There's loads of different terminology for this. Um, and the computer, uh, you just have to make a couple of little observations. So it obviously depends on the kernel size. If your kernel size is bigger, you're looking at a bigger patch. Um, and it look, depends on the kernel sizes of, of what's kind of came before. But it also depends on the strides. If you, so a max pooling layer can be thought of something with a stride 2 if you're just doing pooling over 4 pixels. So you're, t you're, you're reducing the dimension or the, the width and height of your, um, the, layer the, the layer below it by half. So you're looking twice as wide. So to, to compute uh, the effective aperture size, then you just take into these two things into account. And you can do it recursively. So the aperture size for s some layer L is, is just the aperture size for the layer below it, plus how much wider this layer sees times the product of the strides. And you can see this here below here. So the aperture size for this layer here is the aperture size for the layer below it, right, which is 3 in this case, plus ca kernel size minus one, so that's okay, this is kernel size for this is three. So minus one is just taking one step on each size side. So that's that's how many extra pixels it's, it's got here. So you can see that the, the three comes from here and you get one less than the kernel size here. So the effective aperture size of this guy here is five. Uh, this doesn't include pooling, but when you include pooling you just you're just doubling things as you go up. Um, and you know if you're doing kind of things like fully convolutional networks you might hear about later on it's good to keep that in mind. How much context do you think you would need to compute this? Like, so if you want to do, do a, a contour detector, for example, uh, how, how wide in the image you need to look to, to detect whether there's a contour there, and you'll design your network accordingly. So that's, that's everything. Uh, we've shown how to estimate memory and computational requirements. It's useful to be able to quickly estimate these when designing the neural networks, and aperture size tells us how much a node can see. So if anyone has any questions?